So we'll now talk about bilateria. So we are traveling through our animal phyla. We have the split based on tissue. We have the split based on symmetry. So we are now looking at animals that are bilateral and those are split into protostomes and deuterostomes. So we're now going to look at the protostomes and we'll start by looking at the members of Lofa trochozoa. And this includes six different phyla that we'll talk about. Remember that protostomes are defined by having determinant cleavage in the embryo. Um, that means that the early embryo already has its cell fates determined, so you cannot get identical twins if the embryo breaks in half. Each cell already has a particular job, and without those cells, it can't grow. Um, so the members of Lofa trochozoa were defined by molecular features and then aligned with some physical traits. So they either have trochophore larva, which is a specific shape to their larva, functions of their larva, or they have lophophore feeding tentacles, which again are a special type of feeding tentacle. Flatworms, platyhelminthes, mollusks, and annelids all belong to the group that has trochophore larva, and the, the members that have lophophore feeding tentacles are the rotifers, the bryozoans, and the brachiopods. So we'll talk about these more now. So phylum platyhelminthes, also called the flatworms, um, are our bilateral organisms. So they're the first with three embryonic germ layers. Remember that's triploblastic. Um, they have that mesoderm in addition to an endoderm and ectoderm. And this is a key innovation for true muscle and for more sophisticated organs. However, they lack a specialized respiratory or circulatory system to transport gases. That means their only way to get gas to all of their cells is by direct diffusion. So it would be like if you think about your body, your stomach cannot access air directly, so it can't diffuse air on its own. We rely on our respiratory system and our circulatory system to move um, oxygen from, for example, our lungs to our stomach, right? Because our lungs come in direct contact with the air and do diffusion with the air, and then our cells in our, in our blood move that oxygen to our stomach. And that's because our stomach is thick and buried inside of our big three-dimensional body. Flatworms don't have that ability, so they have to be flat. So if this is like the flatworm's body here, they have to be flat because they have to have oxygen move directly to all of their cells. So they can't have them thick and buried inside of their body. Each one of their cells has to be close enough to air to get oxygen. Flatworms are among the first animals with an active predatory lifestyle. So that means they can hunt. In order to hunt, they have to have the ability to sense food. Um, and so that's that bilateral cephalization allows for a concentration of sensory structures in one place. And specifically, they have eye spots. Um, so they look like little eyes at their head. Um, located with those eyes is a cerebral ganglia. So something that's starting to resemble a brain um, that can receive the input from the eye spots and understand what it means. Um, they have also the same nerve net that we see in cnidarians, but again, starting to have it more centralized, so having a little more central control. So again, the benefit of this is now they can actually be looking for food and then move towards it. Interestingly, even though they're cephalized with sensory structures in their nervous system, their um, food attaining structures are not cephalized. So actually their feeding structures, the mouth and the pharynx that comes out of their mouth to suck on food is actually on the underbelly of the organism. And that may be because they kind of crawl onto their food and then suck on it. Um, they can carry out both sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction. Most are hermaphroditic, but they do not usually self-fertilize. So that means they have to go looking for a mate. And so remember, I've mentioned this before that it's advantageous for rare animals to be hermaphroditic because they're, they're, they may not find a mate very often. So if you only find another of your species once every couple of months, 
um, you would not want that to be like by random chance, not be the opposite sex. So it's useful to have both be hermaphroditic. And again, as I mentioned before, while this can be a benefit for some organisms, we don't always see it as an advantage. So when we look at mammals, for example, um, the reproductive systems are too complicated to have in one organism. So we have to have distinct sexes because it's too hard to have like a uterus, ovaries, testicles, penis, like you can't have all of those structures um, because they take up too much space and get too complex. Um, and that's not even getting into the biochemistry. So the hormones um, and balance of the hormones that controls those structures would again, um, it, 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 it just didn't evolutionarily make sense probably to have more than one. So within the um, platyhelminthes, there's four classes. There are the turbillaria. That's the, these um, organisms are free living. Um, so they're just like swimming around in pond water, for example. Um, oftentimes they're scavengers. Um, so they'll like get onto dead fish and eat them. This is planaria pictured here. They're kind of cute. This is an, a microscope. So you can see them with the naked eye, the planaria, but they're really small. Um, like maybe at the size of a paper clip, um, even a little bit smaller. Um, there are fish flukes. Fish flukes are parasites of fish, hence the name fish fluke. Um, and there are tapeworms. They are also parasitic. Um, they oftentimes have multiple host species within their life cycle. This is a picture of a tapeworm inside of a human intestine. And then there are the parasitic flukes um, that also um, have various complex life cycles with multiple hosts. Um, the liver flukes. Um, oh, this is actually a liver fluke. Sorry, this isn't a fish fluke. Um, I forgot. So this picture here is actually a liver fluke. Um, the Chinese liver fluke, which actually has fish, snails, and humans as part of its life cycle. Um, blood flukes uh, are have humans in their life cycle as well. It's the most common parasitic trematode that affects humans. Um, so notice I've only given you the scientific name here for tubularia, um, just to kind of reduce some of your memorization. So you can use the common names for these ones. Okay, phylum mollusca is also in the um, category of protostomes with uh, trochophore larvae. There are 100,000 species of mollusks at least. They're mostly in the ocean. They're also bilateral, um, and they're the only bilateral organisms in the fossil record before the Cambrian explosion. So remember, the Cambrian explosion was when we had this big diversifying um, of diversification of animals. Um, and so they may actually be the first bilaterians. Um, they have a soft body, um, so really delicate body. So think a clam or an oyster or a snail. Um, and it's usually protected with an external shell. So I've said that they're bilateral, um, but this gets confusing for, for people. If you think about a clam, um, does it have bilateral symmetry? And so when most people think of a clam, they think of having eaten one. Um, and so when you've eaten one, it maybe just kind of seemed like this weird shapeless ball. Um, so first of all, you're only eating part of the clam. Um, you're not eating some of the parts that give it its orientation. But also if you were to look at a clam, it actually has like a mouth on one side and an anus on another, and you could only split it in one direction, even though to our minds, it's just this shapeless ball. So a mollusk body plan, again, it has a soft body. There's three major parts. It has a muscular foot, and that's the structure here, um, and it's oftentimes used for movement. That can be for digging, for gliding, or swimming even. Um, and you can see some different types of mollusk movement in action by watching this video. Um, they also have a visceral mass. This is where their organs are, and they have a wide variety of organs. So now they start to have a complex digestive system. It's complete. There's a mouth and an anus. There's a heart. So uh, starting to have a circulatory system, primitive kidneys for an excretory system. So starting to just have a lot more complex organs. And then lining the top part here is called the mantle. And the mantle is what 
produces the shell. So it's it, a layer that's right up against the shell. Um, inside of their mouth, they have a structure called a radula, and that's what's pictured here. Um, it's almost like a tongue, except that it's rasping, so it generally has like sharp stuff on it. Um, so this helps them either move water for filter feeding, or some of them are carnivorous and many are herbivorous as well. And so that radula kind of tears up the food that they're eating um, as it goes into their stomach. So how does a clam get oxygen for cellular respiration? So again, remembering that these organisms are all having to access oxygen just like us, um, they actually have a gill. Now this gill is not structurally the same as a fish's gill, but it has the same function to extract oxygen from water. So um, mollusks reproduce um, through sexual reproduction. Um, they are actually typically mostly separate sexes, so they're not hermaphroditic. Um, and they mostly use external fertilization. So hence the need to not necessarily have um, hermaphrodism because they're just gonna release sperm into the water and the sperm will float to a female um, and to the eggs. Um, now there's a small number of mollusks that do have internal fertilization, um, especially snails and in particular land snails. So notice the keyword here being land. Um, because they um, adapted to life on land, they couldn't rely on sperm just floating through water to get to eggs. And so um, they actually do have to um, have a physical interaction between a male and a female for internal fertilization. There's three major classes of mollusks, the gastropods, the bivalves, and the cephalopods. The gastropods include snails, slugs, and nudibranches, snails and slugs being the ones we're most familiar with. Um, this is the largest class. Um, shells can be reduced or lost, so a slug is really a snail that doesn't have a shell. Um, so that means their species doesn't, so they've adapted and no longer have a shell. Um, most are marine or freshwater, but there are some on land, and so you've probably seen them on land. In Colorado, you're more likely to see a slug than a snail, especially in the Denver metro area. Um, bivalves include clams, mussels, and oysters. These are mostly filter feeders, whereas gastropods are herbivorous or carnivorous usually. Um, then your cephalopods, oh, bivalves, I should mention, clams, mussels, oysters, they have the distinct type of shell, so um, they have a shell that closes all the way around their soft body, okay? And so the, the name bivalve actually refers to that two-parted shell, bi is for two. Um, cephalopods include octopuses, squids, and nautiluses. These are the most um, physically complex of the mollusks. Many of them are fast-swimming marine predators. Um, so they move quickly. So um, they've adapted for movement that's much more quick than a snail or a clam or a mussel or oyster. Um, they have a beak-like jaw, so it almost looks like a little beak sticking out. Um, and that's hard for like getting their food. Um, most do not have a shell. Um, their foot has been modified into a muscular siphon, so it pulls in water um, and that propels their body. Um, and so they're really much more adapted for being fast, right? So those adaptations help them be fast for hunting. Um, to go along with that hunting lifestyle, they have a much more highly developed nervous system, a more complex brain, more complex sensory organs, and particularly good vision. Um, and so you can see an octopus in action by watching this video. So um, octopuses in particular have been really interesting to scientists because they broke with a sort of um, canonical idea, which was that um, invertebrates do not have intelligence. So for a very long time, people sort of assumed that any animal, these lower order animals, remember this judgment of better or not good um, that has oftentimes been in our minds was applied to the invertebrates and said, well, they're not very intelligent. Um, and what we've realized with octopuses is, is that they actually are quite intelligent. Uh, and so this is a, a famous experiment related to this. Um, cephalopods like octopuses actually not only um, do they have some of these physical structures and the ability to hunt, but they can actually learn. Um, so 
In the experiment, they trained octopuses to attack a red or white ball and using reward and punishment. And a lot of animals, lots and lots of animals, including non-intelligent, you know, by a formal definition of intelligence, have this ability. Um, so many, many organisms can be trained. Now, what was special about the octopuses is that the they then took a different octopus that had not been trained and had it watch the trained octopus. And what happened is that the observer octopus learned from the other octopus to go after the specific colored ball. Um, so they learned from the other octopus that they would get food from a particular colored ball. And in fact, those observer octopuses actually learned faster than original training. And so this is um, the true ability to learn um, beyond just reward and punishment learning or training. Uh, and so this was a huge deal. We used to, again, assume that the capacity to learn was only something that was in higher order animals. Um, and so as we think about this, we can realize that the octopus lifestyle and body plan um, explains the evolution of learning or intelligence in these invertebrates. They are very soft bodied. Um, and so they were very vulnerable once they evolved to not have their shell. And so it kind of makes sense that they would have needed to adapt something to compensate for having these really vulnerable bodies. So intelligence may have been one way that they did that. Um, also, they have some things like um, camouflage, um, pulsing colors um, to scare things away, um, ink to hide them. So they have a whole set of adaptations that have helped them when when they lost the shell that protected their tender, soft body. Um, and then of course they're hunting as well. So going searching for food, um, this intelligence was useful.